anyone familiar with the franchise will immediately know the name of James Bond's creator, one Ian Fleming. Believe it or not, the suave British secret agent spy was created by an ex-naval intelligence officer who used his wartime experience as a source of inspiration for the books that introduced the world to 007. However, if trying to work out who are the most important people behind the scenes for shaping the franchise, the numbers two and three in terms of importance would be the American film producer Albert R. Broccoli and his daughter Barbara Broccoli who, between them, have produced nearly every James Bond movie since Dr. No premiered in 1962. Albert, known as Cubby to his friends, formed a partnership with Harry Saltzman and the two purchased the film rights to all but one of Ian Fleming's books. Cubby was involved in so many aspects that shaped the franchise as we know it today. From the gun barrel opening shot, to the John Barry score that has become a trademark. Broccoli had a say in the casting of every lead actor, and though Sean Connery was not his first choice to play the eponymous spy, he became the embodiment of the character, a defining performance that every incumbent has been judged against since. During his tenure, the franchise that the Broccolis began by adapting Fleming's books, before they eventually went on to craft original, genre-defining new adventures that charted globe-trotting espionage thrillers across the 1960s, 70s and 80s. After his death, Covey Broccoli's daughter Barbara took over the reins of the franchise and she managed it through the 1990s and across into the millennium. Their company, Eon Productions, now essentially is the James Bond franchise and they have universal domination of the brand that has been imprinted onto the public consciousness like no other. However, there were two James Bond stories that Cubby Broccoli never managed to get ownership of. The first, Casino Royale, had already been sold five years earlier and it eventually materialised as a very problematic satire film that released in competition with Broccoli's own You Only Live Twice. The second, however, was a result of legal action between Fleming and the Irish screenwriter Kevin McClory. Fleming had collaborated with McClory and Jack Whittingham back in the 1950s, hoping to create a new screenplay that was provisionally titled Longitude 78 West. When this film fell through, Fleming adapted the ideas into what became the novel Thunderball, without crediting McClory or Whittingham at all. Legal disputes followed, and the writer had to pay McClory damages of £35,000, court costs of an additional £52,000, and all film rights to that particular novel. This shouldn't have been a problem for the Broccolis, as when they wanted to adapt Thunderball to be their fourth Bond film, McClory agreed to license them the rights in a 10-year exclusivity deal, as long as he received sole producer credit for the film. Thunderball starred Sean Connery, it was an enormous commercial success on release, and it had BAFTA-nominated visual effects for the underwater photography. After its release, Broccoli and Saltzman resumed the reins of the series and they made one more film with Sean Connery before being forced to recast with George Lazenby to become the second actor to star as 007. Lazenby though only featured in one film and after several other actors declined the role, United Artists chief David Picker declared that Sean Connery should be enticed back and that money was no object. Connery took £1.25 million for his sick performance as James Bond in the film Diamonds Are Forever, and he used that money to set up the Scottish International Education Trust. This was to be his last performance as the character. He declined returning for a seventh outing, and the franchise found a more stable home with Roger Moore as the next leading man. Connery had no regrets. Later he said, I have always hated that damn James Bond. Connery had been an excellent leading man, but the role was a complicated one. He had fights with the producers about the direction of the character, battles over his pay, and increasing concerns about the way international stardom had eroded his privacy. The breaking point came when he was filmed on the toilet during the making of his fifth film, and the argument that resulted in this invasion of privacy led to his first departure, and though he had been tempted back, he and Kirby Broccoli refused to be on set at the same time. Never again, Connery had famously said in 1971. 
Then, in 1976, 11 years after Thunderball's release, and one year after Eon's exclusivity deal had passed, Kevin McClory announced that he had plans to produce an original James Bond film. United Artists and the Fleming trustees sued, but McClory won successive legal battles, pointing out that he had full screenplay rights over the original novel. McClory licensed his new adapted screenplay to Jack Schwartzman, who set about closing any remaining legal issues. They would produce a remake of Thunderball, using elements from both the original screenplay and Fleming's book. They could only use what was in the book, or exclusive to the screenplay, so all of the elements brought by the Broccolis were out. No John Barry soundtrack. No gunshot barrel after a pre credit sequence. No other filmic inventions. This was the chance to return to the core character from Fleming's novels, as the Eon movies had drifted further and further from the original books. And though several experienced members of the film crew who had worked on the 007 franchise were approached, most of them declined out of a sense of loyalty to Cummy Broccoli. The one thing that was brought back from the Eon films, though, was perhaps the least expected. Sean Connery. Connery had famously not portrayed exactly the same character that Fleming had depicted in the original books. He had gone his own way. McClory had initially pictured someone like Richard Burton, but by the time they were actually began to approach production in 1978, Connery was back in the picture, initially just as a consultant on the script, but then eventually as a potential leading man. He had enjoyed a decade away from the franchise, and when Schwartzman saw the benefits of having the original 007 star in their production, Connery negotiated a $3 million fee, casting and script approval, and a percentage of any future profits. Connery seemed content to return to the role now, he was finally receiving a salary worthy of the notoriety of the role, and this time there would be no further demands for him to return to the role for potential sequels. This was a one-off reappearance, just for a single script. Schwartzman assembled a star crew. Irving Kirshner was brought on as director, and this was his next film after The Empire Strikes Back. Douglas Slocum handled the cinematography, and this was his next film after working on Raiders of the Lost Ark. With alumni from both Star Wars and Indiana Jones, the movie had an all-star production team, which is why it was a shame that it was troubled almost from the start. Kirshner later lamented that Jack Schwartzman was an excellent businessman, but he didn't have the experience of a film producer. Connery was unimpressed by a lack of professionalism amongst the team, and went on record later to say that the whole thing felt like a bloody Mickey Mouse operation. At one point, fight choreographer Steven Seagal, years before he would go on to star in his own action movies, broke Connery's wrist whilst training, although this was not noticed at the time. And the film, despite the turbulence leading up to its release, did well. It attempted to combine the sensibilities of Connery's 1960s early Bond with 1980s production values, and there are moments of excellence in the cinematography and the design. The shark attack looks quite realistic. As a whole, I think the underwater filming shows the improved possibilities that 20 years of technological improvements brought to the table. Kirshner's direction is on point, and it makes the best out of the script. And this is, unfortunately, the biggest weakness of the remake. The pacing of the new script is terrible. The Thunderball story was always uneven, but changes introduced in this remake cause all sorts of problems. At times, it willingly dives into all of the negative tropes of the genre headlong, without a care for the danger. As an example, early on, Bond heads for Nassau in the Bahamas, ostensibly to chase Largo. However, by the time he arrives, Largo is already departing for France, and the two never meet. Instead, he's lured into a trap by henchwoman Fatima Blush, and we get a few excellent minutes of underwater drama as he escapes from the trap she set for him. But the entire story thread is ultimately redundant. The action then shifts to France, where Bond attempts to spy on Largo, which he does by walking into the casino and revealing himself to the villain, and then playing what, in 1983, was regarded as futuristic video game technology. 
I always wince when I see video games badly handled in movies. This set piece has all of the trademarks of actors, directors and visual effects artists gamely doing their best whilst none of them are completely in sync about what is actually going on. The war games design, with the spinning world at the start still looks effective enough, but the game itself is just a meaningless collection of flashing lights whilst Connery and the villain clutch joysticks and imitate wincing in pain whilst a crowd of hush socialites watch on. This is supposed to be a modern update of the roulette wheel trope, but it loses all of the class and simplicity that the gambling table classic offer. After this, Largo welcomes Bond onto his boat, gives him the run of the ship, and then seems almost surprised when Bond sabotages his plans. All of the component parts for a competent story are here, but the final script has gaping holes and leaps of logic that defy explanation. The biggest change here is the orientation of the villains. Gone are the mercenary call of the original threats and instead there's a gleeful psychopathy in both the male and female villains Maximilian Largo and Fatima Blush. The two of them have a really good chemistry and they delight in the suffering of others. Barbara Carrera also is gleefully sadistic. However, her character almost feels wasted when she's literally blown up far too early in the film for an effective payoff. Opposite them, there's an early performance from Kim Basinger as the hostage Domino Pitachi. However, the romance between her and Connery, it's a James Bond film, there's always a romance, it never feels realistic. A common offender in these types of movies of this time, but he first meets her by pretending to be her masseuse at a spa. He's literally pumping her for information before he sneaks out as the real masseuse turns up. Then he meets her at the casino, buys her a drink to apologise for violating her, and then trades a small fortune of cash for the opportunity to have her hand for a dance. And then during the tango, he calmly informs her that her brother is dead. The theme is that Domino is a kept woman, that Largo is getting a sadistic delight in spying on her, installing a one-way mirror between his secret office and the gym room she works out in, and holding her hostage. This does crop up several times, and it gives the movie some pathos, but this is not intelligently handled here. The only form of payoff comes from the depiction of Largo blithely trying to sell her to the natives of North Africa, and then getting revenge when it is her who shoots the harpoon that kills him. He simply dies, unable to even speak a word or give an empathetic look at the camera behind his scuba mask. It's not the age difference that makes Domino and Bond a bad pairing on its own, but a combination of that, the pacing of the movie, and the rushed way it forces them together for convenience, rather than them organically pairing off. He rides in on an adventure, and she tags along not on a quest for revenge, which could easily have been her plot thread, but rather seemingly because she doesn't have anywhere else to be. Why the film decides to move location to North Africa in the final act is never explained. There is reference to oil fields, and so, so I suppose geographically it does all hang together, but within the movie's context, it could have been anywhere. All that is seen of Africa and its people are the rabble that comes to buy Domino, surprised locals watching as helicopters fly overhead in amazement, as though they've never seen modern technology before, and lots and lots of underwater caves. The best Bond films make use of their locales to build up stories, characters and themes, but this movie, it wastes Nassau, France and North Africa. Any one of them could have been handled more effectively with ease, but now they are functionally reduced to just background props. They don't matter. But that's fine. Decades later, the only reason to watch this movie is to delight in Sean Connery's final movie performance as James Bond. There's a touch of autopilot to his performance. Maybe he really was just there for the money, but Sean Connery was always watchable, and he is clearly more invested in this film than he was the prior performance in Diamonds Are Forever. The plot was adjusted to pay off on his advancing years. Connery gets to play the movie as if this is all old hat, stuff he's seen before, as in this particular movie's case, he had. For Connery specifically, this works quite well. 
he plays to his strengths, even if he is a little slower and less intense than the gleeful violence of his earlier films. However, it reduces the impact of the rest of the movie. The entire rest of the British Secret Service and all international diplomats are shown as almost incompetent time wasters, caught up in the newfangled, modern ways of thinking, and unable to appreciate the simple brilliance of Bond. At the end of the film, when he announces his retirement, you're left nodding and saying, well, yes, you've looked like you were tired of this the whole time. Particularly as the object of his ire is a very young Rowan Atkinson playing a particularly weak ambassador who showcases the theme of the movie perfectly. Never Say Never Again is about the emasculation of society. But it shows one last great silverback prowling around his territory for one final lap just to check everything's still in order. Connery's performance can be summed up in the phrase, well, they don't make them like they used to. Later, in the 1990s, McClory began investigating a third adaptation of the Thunderball story, perhaps using Timothy Dalton as the new incumbent. Thankfully, the idea was scrapped, leaving Never Say Never Again a very curious oddity in the 007 franchise. Originally released in 1983, it played on the idea that Sean Connery, a decade out of the franchise, was now too old for the part that had made him famous. In fact, Connery continued acting for another 23 years before production woes on the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen finally wore down his patience. He did return to the James Bond franchise one final time, however, in 2005 offering voiceovers for an EA adaptation of his original movie, From Russia With Love, that used both his voice and his likeness to adapt the old classic. He died in 2020, a full 40 years after creating this oddball testament to his own personal legacy.